Here in America, there's no denying just how incredibly lucrative large luxury three-row SUVs can be for a car manufacturer. And for the longest time, Jeep simply didn't have a vehicle that played in that space with vehicles like the Cadillac Escalade and the Lincoln Navigator. Now for 2022, that all changed because Jeep has finally brought back a nameplate that we haven't seen in the States for over 30 years. That's right, the Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer is back. And this week, as you can see, Jeep has loaned me a mid-trim 2022 Grand Wagoneer Series 2. Now, when I first drove this vehicle a couple months ago back in New York City, it was the worst place to drive a vehicle that's this big, this heavy, and this cumbersome. So now that I have the car for a week to test in my local area, I'm gonna drive the vehicle like most people would. I'm gonna find out what the gas mileage is. We're gonna do a zero to 60 performance. We're gonna live with the car and do some normal everyday things that consumers might do. And at the end of this video, we're gonna find out, has Jeep truly delivered a Grand Wagoneer that lives up to its lofty name? And does it compete head on with vehicles like the Cadillac Escalade and Lincoln Navigator? Stay tuned to find out. Now with a starting price of around $88,000, you better believe that this vehicle is going to compete with other luxury SUVs. And to do that, you need to start, of course, with the design that really stands out. It has to attract people in. It also has to look expensive. And in that regard, I'm not entirely sure Jeep has successfully completed that first step. Now, don't get me wrong, this vehicle is definitely handsome looking. It has the traditional Jeep styling elements here, like the corporate seven slot grille. It also is massive. When you get a sense of this vehicle or when you see the vehicle in person, it really shows you the sheer size of the Grand Wagoneer. I mean, yes, it also kind of looks like a Grand Cherokee, uh, which is already a handsome vehicle, but you also want it to be stand out in a way because the Escalade, the Navigator, the Mercedes GLS and X7 all have very, very in your face proportions. Now, of course, this particular one here is painted in black diamond. It's actually a one tone mono or monotone color. Uh, most Grand Wagoneers I've seen have the two tone look. So I'm, I imagine a lot of buyers are gonna appreciate this all, the fact that it's all one color. This black diamond goes well, of course, with the standard Jeep Performance LEDs, which have sequential LED turn signals, LED low and high beams, LED daytime running lights, and as you can see, LED fog lights. The satin chrome trim here in the grille works really well with this black. You can see the way it sparkles, gives this car a very, very aggressive and luxury look. In fact, here in Pennsylvania, it gets a lot of attention everywhere I took it, especially from other Jeep owners and from truck owners. I love the signature seven slot grill here. You can see how incredibly sparkling it is. I love the fact that it says Wagoneer on the front. There's not a single Jeep badge on the front of this vehicle. And that's what gets people noticing the car because yes, you can tell it's a Jeep, but the fact that it doesn't say Jeep on it really makes people look up close. They wanna see what type of Jeep this is. And then they get really shocked when they see that it's a Wagoneer. Now looking around the side profile, I mentioned in my last video how big this car is. It's about 10 inches longer than the Grand Cherokee L, but it's also bigger than the Cadillac Escalade short wheelbase and the Navigator by about five or three to five inches. And that's where the, the Grand Wagoneer kind of slots between something like the Escalade uh, and the Escalade ESV. This is kind of paired in between. Jeep says that a longer wheelbase version will eventually come. Um, I'm not entirely sure why you'd want something that's even bigger than this, but just know that there will be a bigger version eventually. Now, the Grand Wagoneer comes standard with either a 20 inch wheel for the base series one. The series two comes with these 22 inch wheels. They are massively wrapped in 285, 45 R22 tires. These are obviously not going to be off-road capable or trail, trail rated. You'll have to go to a Wagoneer if you guys want an off-road package, which still doesn't make this vehicle trail rated. But the Grand Wagoneer comes standard with the company's air suspension, which will lift up the suspension nearly four inches from like eight inches all the way up to 10 inches. Uh, and then you can also bring it back down when you're trying to load the vehicle up or put it into an aero mode. Uh, this boxy shape definitely gets a lot of attention. I love this boxy shape, especially when you have it paired in this all black color with the chrome trim around the windows and whatnot. It makes the vehicle look especially interesting looking. The rear isn't particularly my favorite angle of this car. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, most models will come standard with a full panel roof. You can see it even includes a glass portion over the third row, which is nice. Um, the uh, roof rails, as you can see, are the more aerodynamic design. And from the rear, I think that the car can have some interesting angles, but also look a little bit awkward at times. You can see Grand Wagoneer is spelled out very proudly at the back. Not a single Jeep badge. Again, you have to really look closely 
in like the taillight housing if you guys want to find a Jeep badge in this vehicle. But you can see all the chrome really sticks out, of course, with this black diamond exterior color. The sequential LED turn signals continue onto the rear and you have full LED lighting, which is nice. You have more of that chrome trim. Your reverse lights are down here on the bumper. And then you can see Jeep decides to hide the exhaust underneath the rear. Uh, and then they also put a series trim badge on the back depending on whether you go for the Series 1, Series 2, or the Series 3, and there's also an Obsidian trim. Now, of course, a power liftgate is going to be included in something like this, and then when you open up the tailgate, Jeep says you get nearly class-leading space back here. In fact, with the third row seat up, you get a total of 27 and a half cubic feet of space, which is pretty good. If you wanna fold down the third rows, you can do that by just simply pushing this button right here. It's a power folding third row. The headrests also uh, come down automatically. This will expand it to about 72 cubic feet of space, which is really good. You have nearly a flat floor here. It's basically a flat floor. And then underneath this carpeted area, you can see Jeep does have some underfloor storage over here, which is nice. The spare tire is going to be located underneath the vehicle on the outside. And if you want to fold down the second row, uh, that center console sadly does eat up into the space. So if you guys go for a series two and up with the captain's chairs, it will drop the fully maximum cargo capacity to around 95 cubic feet. Uh, with, the th with the second row bench, you'll actually get 116, which is more than what you find in the Escalade and more what you than what you find in the Navigator. So now let's move on to the interior of this particular Series 2. It is a black on black combination, which is very popular for a lot of consumers. First thing I wanna show you guys is the key fob. You can see it says Grand Wagoneer on it, no Jeep badges whatsoever. It is a newer key. It includes the ability to lower the air suspension, open the tailgate, and of course, remote start the vehicle. And smart key access is gonna be standard, of course, on every Grand Wagoneer. Now, as you open the door, you can see the running boards pop open. These are a power deploying running board, which really helps with getting in this vehicle. There's also a nice grab handle here for a short person like myself to kind of help hoist yourself in. The seat, the front seats are 24-way adjustable. They include a massage function. They are heated and ventilated, and it even says Grand Wagoneer there just to remind people that you have the fanciest Jeep ever. The seat controls are on the um, door panel, which is very Mercedes-like. You have a wonderful soft touch real leather on the entire door panel. Even down here, it is covered in real leather with real uh, metal trim. Um, you have real walnut wood which is different versus the one that I showed you guys, which had the blue agave with the aluminum trim. This is definitely a more classic looking interior. Not the best, of course, for showing on camera stuff. But as I get into the vehicle, the running board and the scrap handle makes it really easy. And once you're up here, oh my gosh, you have a commanding view. The one thing the Grand Wagoneer is unavailable with are power soft closing doors. That's something its competitors do offer. Sadly, Jeep doesn't offer that, so you have to close the door manually. But once you slam the door, it has a wonderful solid sounding thunk. Again, you all expect that in a vehicle that has this expensive of a price tag. Now, uh, the start stop button is right where you'd expect it. I love the detail here where Jeep kind of pushes the button forward and then has um, some leather actually uh, covering the back housing of the button. And then when you start the car up, I've already showed you guys a full interior overview, so I'm gonna to try to keep this a little bit more brief. You can see you've got the largest screens that Jeep, or that you'll ever find in a Stellantis vehicle. There's a 12 inch display here, a 12 inch display here for the Uconnect 5 system, a 10 inch display here, and then my tester is missing the, 12, the 10 inch passenger side screen for an extra $1,200. It would be nice to have that, but then again, here you have a, dis, a screen over here, a digital rear view mirror, and then you have a heads up display. That's all included in the Series 2 model. The dash itself is very wide and expansive. You you can see there's a ton of like length here, but I also love how it's real leather stitching on this part of the dash. You have real walnut trim. You have real leather down here on the center console. In addition to the wonderfully leather wrapped wheel with the two spoke design, this plays homage to or homage to the original Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer that had the um, kind of two spoke design steering wheel. It is a power tilt and telescoping steering wheel, of course, with an ability to change gears here through a manual mode, but no paddles on the wheel. A lot of piano black plastic trim. This uh, controls your active driving assist. This display, of course, is customizable. You can put the GPS function in here. My tester also has optional night vision. Um, as you can see there, as I wait for the map to display, uh, to, to load up, you can see there's what it looks like as it continuously tries to load. That's where I noticed that the lag is a little bit annoying in this vehicle. Um, but you can see, you can put your trip information, vehicle information, then you can just go to a traditional look for the speedo and the tack. That is all pretty, pretty nice, although the graphics, I think, there's something about it that also looks a little bit basic. Uh, and I noticed that as well in the Grand Cherokee. It's a little bit more noticeable here in the Grand Wagoneer. 
although this is pretty similar to the Navigator. The uh, Escalade, however, has that massive display where you can put the real uh, GPS in it. That just looks like even more impressive versus this vehicle. Now over here, you can see there's my phone with the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. I did notice at times that sometimes it wouldn't connect to my phone immediately. I had to wait a couple of seconds uh, to, a, to a minute or so for it to connect, which was frustrating. But as you can see, once it's working, it's quick, it's snappy. Going over here to vehicle, you can adjust all your custom settings, of course. You can go to an off-road page, which most people, I imagine, won't be taking this vehicle off-roading. Uh, and then it also has the ability to do smart voice activation, which um, you can access through that little microphone button over there and you can kind of change things here it has customizable ambient lighting as well although the ambient lighting in this vehicle only offers five different colors you can see that color matches the light grills on the speakers for the macintosh audio system this one here has the 19 speaker system it's missing the 23 speaker option that you can get uh, with the series 3. Um, the lighting itself looks okay that's what it looks like at night I think the Escalade has slightly better lighting. Haven't seen the new Navigator yet, so I can't comment on there. But it's nothing compared to what BMW and Mercedes are putting in their vehicles. Uh, down here, you can see actual knob for volume, for tuning, your four-zone climate control is standard. And then, of course, you can access the full massaging seats here, which Jeep offers five different levels of massage. They all work extremely well. You can see your heated and cooled seat butt controls are over here. But these buttons are a little bit hard to see in bright sunlight, and they also don't work very well. Sometimes I notice that they... Again, I'm touching it there. It's not bringing down the level of heat. I have to, again, keep touching it. And I think that's a miss right there where it doesn't work very well. That's something that I think Jeep could fix. Um, if you guys are looking for your wireless phone charging pad and a USB port, it's hidden behind the screen. If you push that button right there or tap that button, you can see the screen uh, electrically moves out of the way. And then there's four USB ports. There's a total of 22 USB ports in this vehicle, which is just ridiculous. There's your wireless phone charging pad. Your, some of your driver assistance features are there. There's an automatic parallel parking function, uh, toll hall mode, of course. This is the transmission selector, which is metal. Feels nice right there. However, when I start rotating it, it feels a little plasticky when I start rotating it. So that's a detail that I think Jeep could fix. But I like that at least it looks good and it is made of real metal. When you put the vehicle into reverse, you can see there's the full 360 camera necessary on a vehicle like this. It also has rear cross traffic alert and front cross traffic alert, which is what you would expect. And something with this price tag, your drive mode selector, of course, is right here. There's a rock, sand, mud, snow, auto, and then a sport mode. And then your adjustable air suspension is right here. There's five different levels. Of course, you have a four low, uh, and then it has a downhill assist control. More of that beautiful walnut wood, massive cup holders, of course. There's really nice, interesting storage right here where you can put your sunglasses, two more USB ports, of course. My tester is missing the um, center console storage cooler, which I tried in my first video, and it works really well. It actually does keep your drinks really cold. Uh, the seats are really comfortable and supportive. They adjust in 24 different ways. You can also kind of crimp the uh, head restraint over there and make it come forward or back. This is the Palermo leather, but it's not the full diamond quilted leather. I do think the seats are comfortable, but they could be softer considering the fact that these are their top quality Palermo leather seats. I noticed that, of course, as well in the Grand Cherokee. Uh, and then above me, you can see lots of LED lighting. There's a massive panoramic sunroof, which has this really great sunshade that blocks the light out if you guys don't want any light. Um, more leather stitching over here. And then when you open this up, the glove box is actually kind of small. It is damped and lined with felt. It's a bin style. Uh, but other than that, the interior is roomy, spacious, has all the necessary high quality details like the suede headliner. And you get a sense that you're driving something that is significantly larger than even the Grand Cherokee L. So I think Jeep definitely nailed uh, the feeling of space and luxury in this Grand Wagoneer. Now let's hop into the back seat and the third row of the Grand Wagoneer. You can see my tester has this uh, second row captain's chair. You can also, also option in a bench chair if you guys prefer. That'll increase the seating capacity to eight. This one here is seven. That's another difference between the Grand Cherokee is that only seats up to seven. This will seat up to eight. Now in terms of door materials, you can see same beautiful leather, same wood, same leather all the way down here to the lower portion. And you have these manual uh, sun shades, which is nice. These seats also offer up to 42 inches of leg room, which is huge. It makes it one of the most uh, roomiest seats in the segment. You can also push the seats forward and back. Uh, again, there's a nice little power running board here with a grab handle to help shorter folks like myself get in. And then once you get in and shut the door, you can see this is basically just as nice as the front seats. You have the ability to recline the seats, push the seats back. This one here is missing the rear seat entertainment system with the Amazon Fire TV, which would be nice to have. Uh, but you can see there are your own set of climate controls. There's more USB ports, a another power let. You have rear seat air vents over here and over here. And then you have a 10 inch display here where you can control the rear climate controls. There are heated rear seats back here, 
but my tester is missing a package that'll roll in ventilated seats. Uh, I don't believe massaging seats are available. I wasn't expecting that, but the fact that you can get heated and cooled seats back here is a nice touch. The center console is practically mimicked from the front. You also, again, have storage over there with more USB ports, and then you have a pretty deep center console storage area over here. Sadly, this does not come out. This is fixed in place, so it does take up space, but, um, if you actually want to have, you know, adults back here, this is the way to, to do it, especially with all this legroom. The floor here isn't completely flat, so if you guys do go for the bench, um, it will intrude a little bit on your space. But Jeep prides themselves on saying this is the roomiest third row and second row in the segment. So let's go ahead and show you guys the third row. To get back here, obviously with the center console, you have to get out, but Jeep makes it pretty easy. You just push this little button over here that, that pushes the seat forward and then you have to manually push the seat out of the way. But once you do that, you can see the third row can comfortably, and I mean comfortably, sit three people across and sit adults back here. There's a total of 36.6 inches of legroom. That's two inches more than what you get in the Escalade and about an inch more than what you get in the Navigator. So this is, again, best in class rear seat legroom. You can comfortably fit three adults back here because the vehicle is so wide. You can see there's a ton of space. There's also, your own set of a sunroof back here, which lets in more light, which is fantastic. Although this is just a manual shade, it's not power. Uh, this is part of the interior camera monitor. So if you got kids back here, you can also keep an eye on them through the front, through that little camera system. And materials back here are surprisingly decent. You have more of that soft um, microfiber suede. This is hard touch plastic, but this is nice and padded over here. You have more USB ports, rear seat air vents, which again, wasn't expecting that. And then you have a power recline function for the third row seat, which is great. This side actually doesn't move forward and back, but as you can see at five foot seven, I can easily sit back here for hours and hours. It's a really comfortable back seat. So keep that in mind if you guys are looking for uh, passenger space. This offers the most in this segment as long as you don't go to a Suburban or like a Navigator L. Now under the hood of the Grand Wagoneer, you're gonna get just one engine choice and it is a good engine. It's an upgrade over the 5.7 V8 that you find in the Wagoneer. And this 6.4 liter beast is the same motor that you find in something like the Dodge Challenger Scat Pack. It also makes the Grand Wagoneer the most powerful uh, vehicle in its American three row body on frame segment. Now you can see there is plenty of space underneath this massive hood, which leads me to believe that Jeep will eventually offer this vehicle with a diesel or an electrified option. But of course, this is the good big boy muscle car V8. It's got the 6.4 V8, 392 cubic inches. It makes 471 horsepower and 455 pound feet of torque. That makes it more powerful than the Escalade and the Navigator, but it does have less torque versus its competitors. So that does of course give you a slight trade-off. It all goes out through a standard eight speed torque flight automatic ZF transmission. It's a really good transmission. Four wheel drive is gonna be standard on the Grand Wagoneer and they offer several different four wheel drive systems. This one here has the Quadra Drive 2 system. Them. So it does come with a low range transfer case. Um, towing capacity also is best in class at 9850 pounds, almost 10,000 pounds. The Wagoneer will do that full 10,000 pounds. Jeep says the payload is around 1,350 pounds. And fuel economy is the trade off here. This vehicle does guzzle gas more than its competitors at 13 in the city, 18 on the highway. Premium gas is recommended. It's got a 26 and a half gallon gas tank. So that's a big gas tank. And this vehicle is very heavy. It weighs in at around 6,400 pounds. Jeep Jeep says, however, despite the heft, you should be getting to 60 in under six seconds. So we'll be testing that out when we go out in the test drive. So here we are in the most expensive and most luxurious Jeep that the company has ever built. We're talking about a car that can easily top $110,000 if you basically buy it fully loaded. And a couple months ago, or almost three months ago, when I first drove this vehicle in New York City, it wasn't the best place to drive something that's this heavy and big. So now that I have it for a week, it's nice to finally be able to drive this vehicle in wider open spaces, arguably where most people are going to be driving vehicles like this. Uh, and I have to admit, I was not anticipating the Grand Wagoneer to drive and to feel this good. I mean, for those of you who are questioning the fact that this is able to compete with an Escalade and a Navigator, you just need to drive one. You need to see one of these in person because it is just so incredibly, incredibly good that uh, you really get a sense that it is very much a luxury oriented vehicle. It feels like luxury in this car, but with 471 horsepower, nearly 500, let's go ahead and test out the zero to 60 of this bad boy. Ooh. <laughs> Holy crap, this thing is fast. 
Wow, I just got zero to 60 in 5.05 seconds. Now that is with a slight downhill assist, but uh, Jeep basically says you should be able to do a sub six second sprint. And this thing feels quick. I mean, for a 50 or for a 6,400 pound SUV, it is just shocking how, how well this vehicle moves off the line. I mean, it is the most powerful engine in the segment. It's got more horsepower than the uh, Lincoln Navigator. It's got more horsepower than the Cadillac Escalade. Uh, it does have less torque, however, than the Escalade and the Navigator, but with so much power, it is shocking how fast this SUV is. You just didn't expect a vehicle this heavy to move as quickly as it does. Uh, and the fact that Jeep, you know, puts this much power in something like this really makes the car feel special. Now, I just want to test it out one more time to see if I can get a, a similar number. Oh God. Quick shifting eight speed too. All right, now we are going slightly uphill and I got, I just got 5.28 seconds. So I'll take that number. Basically mid five seconds, uh, zero to 60 is very, very impressive for a vehicle that moves as fast. You can credit, of course, the short gearing, that quick shifting eight speed. And the fact that this is basically the same engine that's out of the SCAT pack. It's the 6.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 engine, Hemi, of course, no direct injection. Um, it does have cylinder deactivation, but it's a relatively low tech push rod engine, but it still shows just how effective a muscle car V8 is, especially in a vehicle like this. I might put my foot down here and it's like, <laughs> really, really responsive transmission. I'm super impressed with the driving dynamics of this car. It just, or the acceleration, the acceleration shocked me. This is the quickest accelerating big luxury three row in the segment. Uh, of course, when you not are counting the Europeans, it's the quickest accelerating American made one because the Europeans are gonna be faster. Uh, and I wouldn't even bother comparing this thing to like electric like a Tesla Model X because this is a body on frame truck that can tow almost 10,000 pounds. Now, Jeep actually told me when I first drove this car that it's the smallest driving three row luxury SUV that you'll ever drive. And <laughs> that couldn't be more far from the truth. This thing feels massive. You just know that you're driving something that's built off of a Ram 1500 uh, pickup truck chassis because the ride quality is smooth, but these big 22s do make every bump noticeable. The air suspension with adaptive dampers does their best to quell the bumps, but you still get a sense that this thing has massive wheels and tires. You can feel the weight. You can tell it has a body on frame design <laughs> um, because it has a little bit of a jiggliness when you go over bumps. Uh, it's not quite as smooth riding as the Escalade, I don't think. I haven't driven the newest Navigator yet, um, but this vehicle's ride quality is good. It's just not the best in class. I think that's where Jeep could tweak it a little bit more. Visibility also is good. You have this commanding view of the road. These massive side mirrors also show plenty of what's behind you and what's beside you, but they do actually eat into your visibility a little bit when you're looking to the side. You could lose a car uh, behind that side mirror because it's so big. The pillar here is also relatively big. Um, all of Jeep's active driver assistance comes standard, although their active driving assist where it offers a hands-free function that's coming uh, later next year, not yet available. Um, but this car's driver assistance does work well. I love the rear view camera mirror. Also, it allows you to see exactly uh, what's behind you. You can also go to a standard mirror if you guys don't like the rear camera mirror. But really, every time I drive this vehicle, especially around town, I can feel the size of it. I can feel the fact that it's heavy. I can feel the fact that it's so long. But I'm sitting here getting a massage. The heated and the heated seats work wonderfully. The heated steering wheel looks nice. Or works nice. You have heat, ventilated seats as well. I mean, the massage in this Jeep is probably one of the better ones that I've tested. Much better than what I last drove in the Escalade and the um, old Expedition. Haven't driven the new Navigator Expedition just yet. But I'm genuinely shocked. If I have one big criticism with this car, is it's the gas mileage. In my week's worth of testing, I've only been averaging 12 miles to the gallon. 12 miles to the gallon. That's horrible. And then on the highway, it only got about 16 miles to the gallon. So below the EPA's numbers, but still, it's about one to two mpg less than its comp competitors. Now I, I know people in this segment don't expect great gas mileage, but uh, Jeep is definitely bringing up the rear here. This is like 
on par with something like a Toyota Sequoia that gets horrible gas mileage. So people who have money who can afford this still don't want to have to be paying, you know, this much for gas. And it's you're talking about hundred dollar Phillips when you've got a twenty six and a half gallon gas tank uh, and you've got four dollar plus uh, gallon gas for premium, which this car recommends premium. You couldn't put regular in it. You can put regular in it, but I imagine most of you are probably going to want to put premium in this thing. It's got a big V8. But other than that, it is a wonderful first effort from Jeep to finally, finally give us a vehicle that compete with the large luxury three-row truck-based SUVs. I'm just not entirely sure people are going to be willing to pay this much money for a Jeep. I am shocked, however, uh, in my week's worth of testing here in the um, central PA area, it gets a lot of attention, a lot of attention from Jeep and truck owners. People just, they see this car and they know that it's a Jeep from the seven slotted grille, but then they see the sheer size of it and they're shocked because it sits right next to Escalades, right next to Navigators, right next to Expeditions and Yukons and Tahoes. But it also is a Jeep and that's what really makes it unique and cool is the fact that this is a Jeep. It's not a trail rated Jeep, but the fact that Jeep finally, you know, gave us something that they've needed for so long really shows that the company is committed to delivering what Americans are wanting to buy. And I'm just excited to see more of these on, on the road. So the Wagoneer drives great, comfortable, luxurious, very, very quick. Uh, and is it worth the money that Jeep is asking? That's really up to the consumer. So I'll be curious to see how sales, you know, pale out for a vehicle like this as it uh, continues to be on, on sale here in the marketplace. It's been on sale right now for about probably the last four or five months. So after spending a full week with the brand new 2022 Jeep Grand Wagoneer, I have to admit, this vehicle impresses me a lot more than I thought it would initially. I mean, on paper, the car has pretty impressive specs. I wasn't in too impressed with the design when I first saw it in pictures. Uh, however, in the real world, when you live with this vehicle, it's got an incredible amount of interior space. It's got a V8 that delivers all the right muscle car noises. It also accelerates this vehicle with authority. The only downside is the poor gas mileage and the interior with all of its tech, that plethora of screens, although my tester sadly was missing the rear seat entertainment and the passenger side screen. The Uconnect 5 system does work well most of the times, although I did, there were instances where I noticed it would lag or it wouldn't connect to my phone with, through the wireless CarPlay. Initially, it had to take a few seconds for it to actually boot up. Uh, and other than just feeling like a big SUV at times, which is how most of its competitors drive, Jeep has built one hell of a large three row SUV. And this is no crossover. This is a real body on frame SUV with air suspension that feels distinctively premium. I'm just not entirely sure buyers are gonna be quite ready to pay the price of uh, the prices that Jeep is asking. I mean, this car starts at 88 grand for the Grand Wagoneer Series 1. Keep in mind that a Wagoneer Series 1, which isn't technically available yet, starts at just under $60,000. This makes the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer roughly seven to $10,000 more expensive than its direct American rivals. Now keep in mind, the Grand Wagoneer's starting price at 88 does include four wheel drive. That is a $3,000 upcharge on something like the Escalade and the Navigator. So those vehicle, vehicles with four wheel drive typically start around 80 grand versus this is around 87, $88,000. My tester here starts at 95 grand because it's the Series 2. Add in the couple of options that it has, about $3,500 worth of options, and you're looking at a total price of $101,000. $101,000 is expensive and it's still missing about 10 grand worth of options that would push a Series 3 uh, Grand Wagoneer to be over $110,000. And at that money, it is questionable for me. You really have to get back the fact that, get by the fact that this is a Jeep, although there aren't very many Jeep badges on it, but it is different, it is unique, it is new. And for some that may be uh, worthy of considering this car and also spending the money. But just keep in mind, there are a lot of Escalades, there are a lot of Navigators out there. This is still relatively new, it gets a lot of attention, but Jeep has also delivered one of the roomiest cabins, the most tech featured cabins, and uh, one of the most impressive vehicles that the company has produced year to date. So I am very excited for this new Grand Wagoneer. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2022 Jeep Grand Wagoneer. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook, and as always guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.